Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. Uh, today, some a couple people asked me to do a, a Neiman video. They said, oh, that'll get you lots of views. Just put Neiman in the title and people will watch it. I said, well, okay. Um, so I thought we'd pick a game where he won at the U.S. Championship. But first, let's take a look at his rating. Uh, Neiman's rating, he's 41st in the world. We can see the active rating list here. <clears throat> and the difference here is, I think, how much he gained at the U.S. Championship. And you'll notice he gained 0 0.1 points. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means he played exactly at his rating. Um, there's a whole bunch of schools of thought, of course, about this. By, usually by a lot of people don't know that much. We've had a lot of good trainers say that they've trained Neiman, and he is a very talented young grandmaster. But aside from that... Some people have said that Neiman's not, you know, his, ga his recent gains of a couple hundred points in the last couple years is unusual, and he's not normally really that good, and he must have been cheating. Well, okay, if that's true, and he played at the U.S. Championship and he gained 0 0.1 points, that means he played almost exactly as good as his rating shows, which means if he was cheating to get up to that level, then he had to be cheating at the U.S. Championship, too, which was very, very heavily, you know, checked for cheating devices because of all the scandals recently. But either Neiman is really 2699 strength, or he was cheating during the U.S. Championship to maintain that strength. Much more likely it's the former. Now, some people have said a 2699 player can't beat Magnus Carlsen in one game. He must have been cheating against Carlsen. Well, he certainly could have. We don't know. And his past cheating doesn't lend well for that kind of thing. But is it possible for a young 2699 player to beat a 2850 player in one game if the 2850 player has a bad day and the 2699 has a good day? And the answer is, of course. Now, it's a lot harder for a 2699 to beat a 2850 than it is, let's say, for 1100 to beat a 1250 just because the standard deviation is much higher for the lower players. <clears throat> but... Is it possible? And the answer is, of course it's possible. You know, did Neiman cheat? I have no idea. They've already taken them to court. I'm sure a lot of the evidence will come up there. I do believe when international master Ken Reagan said that, that he analyzed that game with the engine, with his special, you know, anti-cheating software, and it said basically that they came up with no noticeable cheating results on Neiman playing against in his game against Carlson. That's probably the strongest evidence that we have, but I personally don't have anything to say. Okay, let's get to the game. This game was played in round 10 against the lowest rated player in the U.S. Championship, Grandmaster Moradiabadi, and Neiman was black, so let's look at the game. White opened up with d4, knight f6, knight f3, g6, probably indicating either some sort of King's Indian or Grunfeld. C4, if black's going to play a Grunfeld now, he has to play D5. But the problem with playing D5 here is that white can play C takes D, knight takes D5, and then E4. And black doesn't have knight takes C3 to force white to recapture and get a tempo. And that means his knight has to retreat, and that's not as good. So more likely, black would play a king's Indian. And that's what he does, bishop to G7. Knight C3, now white can play E4. Black can still play a Grunfeld now with d5. In fact, if we look at the database on the right, castles is the most common move, and white did uh, pretty well against castles. When black plays d5, white only won 28% instead of 37% in the master database. So actually, d5 here is a good move. Neiman decides to play like a king's Indian in castle. And now Moria Dabi, I don't know if he's worried about Neiman's opening preparation or he just likes to play, you know, rarer lines, but he plays this move bishop g5, which the engine calls an inaccuracy. I wouldn't say it's an inaccuracy. It's been played 2,545 times in the master database, but the engine doesn't like it as much. Uh, black continues with c5. If we look at the database, d6 and c5 and h6 are the only moves pretty much ever played here. c5 is playing it like a Benoni, where you attack the center with the c5 against the d4, c4. <clears throat> White plays it like a Benoni and plays d5. Black plays d6, and now we're pretty much transposing into Benoni territory. 
And here, white normally plays e3, as we see in the database, and that's what Moria Dobby played. The, the move e4 could also be played. They both did about equally well. White plays e3. Black plays knight bd7. If we look at the database, h6 was played the most. e6, a6, and knight a6. Knight a6, to bring the knight back to c7 and support the break moves. Let's show that. Knight here, bishop here, knight here, castle. Here's the break moves, b5 and e6. And the knight on c7 does a good job supporting that. So that was played. Um, the move that, that Neiman plays was only played three times before, and it got one win, one draw, and one loss. Knight bd7, if we turn on the engine, whoops, we don't want to do that. We want to keep the board on there. Uh, let's roll the board to the right so you can see the moves in the database. Okay, there we go. All right, so you saw the moves before I was reading the database to you, but now you can see the moves and the database. All right, if we turn on the engine, the engine says <clears throat> at depth 36 from the cloud, Queen b6 is the number one move, h6 is second, but Neiman's move, knight bd7, is third, and it's only a tenth of a pawn below. All right, we'll turn off the engine, knight bd7, bishop e2, and now black starts pushing that bishop around. One of the ideas when black white plays an early bishop g5 is to do this. Black plays h6 and hits the bishop, bishop h4, and now... Here, a lot of low-rated players are afraid to play a move like g5. I'm sure Neiman and the engine are not. The engine says the two best moves are a6, preparing that b5 break on the queen side, and g5, the move that Neiman played. You could say, oh my, he's weakening his king. Not really. Black's getting space around his king. He has a lot of pieces over there. If he gets mated later, it's not because he played g5. White, of course, has to save the bishop. And black says, let me go after the bishop pair with knight to h5. The bishop has nowhere to go, so black's going to be able to trade that knight for the bishop. If, if white tries to play knight takes g5, super mistake, trying to hit the knight, then the knight will simply take the bishop and threaten to take the rook and also to take the knight. So there's no real discover attack here that's any danger. White instead plays queen to c2. Black brings his other knight over. Notice this knight has no retreat now. If white could play g4, he could even trap the knight. But of course, that's quite impossible. So Neiman's just basically saying, I'm going to take off that bishop sooner or later, probably after you castle so you can't make use of the semi-open h file. White says, let me threaten to take that knight. Neiman says, okay, well, my other knight's guarding it. So Neiman gets ready for his queenside break move with a6. And white says, no, I'm not going to let you do that. I'm going to play a4, and you're not going to play b5 anytime in the near future. Neiman plays bishop d7, again supporting b5, but right now white's got one, two, three, four pieces on it, and black only has two. So if black would do that, it would have to be a sacrifice. You do see those kind of sacrifices occasionally, but probably not here. So white plays a5. Also saying, if you play your break move now, I can take en passant and isolate your H pawn, A pawn on the semi-open file. <clears throat> Black plays rook b8 and says, yes, I would think of doing that, but that will give me an, a, a semi-open file on the b file for my rook. White says, all right, I'll finally I'll castle. Black says, that's what I was waiting for. Now I can take your bishop. A lot of beginners here like to take F takes e g3 to open up the file for the rook they love that semi-open file the problem is those three pawns on the outside are very weak they're almost like only two pawns the e pawn would be isolated if you look over here at the engine the engine says taking toward the center which is the normal principle is 0.0, .0. the game is dead even if Moria Dabi would play it more like a low rated player and play f takes g3 and open up the line for the rook he would be down by seven tenths of a pawn. That's a really big mistake to lose seven tenths of a pawn like that. So if you're one of those people that always take with the F pawn to open your rook, you might pay attention to this and realize taking toward the center is almost always right unless that F file gives you some sort of immediate tactical chances. And right now, 
there are no such tactical chances. All right, so white takes toward the center, h takes g3, and black plays knight g4. It says in the on the engine that black has several moves to keep equality. He could also play his break moves on the queen side. Knight to g4. <clears throat> white says, where are you going, Mr. Knight? Let me attack it again. Now black has a choice between it or guarding it with f5 or bringing it back to e5 or bringing it back to f6. If he brings it to e5, white might be able to play f4. Knight f6 is sort of offering a draw. Black says, <clears throat> I'm going for the gusto. He has the bishop pair. He plays f5. White breaks that up with e4, <clears throat> threatening to remove the guard by taking the pawn on f5. White, of course, can't, sorry, black, of course, can't take on e4 because he would lose the knight on g4. So black moves the knight back. White decides to trade. Black takes with the bishop. And now the engine says if white would play his break move f4, the game would be even, even though the knight on e5 could get into d3. Instead, white plays knight f3, which is also okay. Again, pretty much the game has been even the last few moves. Black plays queen to e8, planning to bring the queen up on the king side, probably to g6. Black decides to trade knights. <clears throat> white, of course, takes with the bishop. Now those dark squares in the middle of the board are controlled by that dark squared bishop, and white doesn't have a dark squared bishop. The average value of the bishop pair is about a half a pawn. Here, white has some other advantages, maybe a little bit of space. So the engine says the chances are about equal. White hits the queen and says, go away. Black has to decide, do I want to move my queen away or do I want to let black get rid of my bishop pair? He says, I'll let him get rid of my bishop pair. The engine says, okay. In that case, we're back to zero, zero. Bishop takes, queen takes, no more bishop pair for black. White plays queen e2. And now black needs to activate his pieces. The question is, does he want to play a move like b6 on the queen side and open up the b file, or does he want to put both his rooks on the semi-open f file? He decides for the latter, and he plays rook f7. Again, the engine's still saying 0, 0, 0. And now white plays knight e4. And the engine says white should just get that rook over here to the middle and fight in the middle against black's pieces, and the chances would be about equal. So knight e4, where's that knight going? Well, he's not going to g3. He's not going to g5. He's not going to f6. He's not going to d6. He's not going to c5. He's probably not going back where he came from. So maybe he's going to d2. But if he goes to d2, the b pawn would be hanging, so he has to guard that first. So this all doesn't make a lot of sense. All right, so black decides to start targeting the f pawn, and he plays there. The knight is guarding it from e4. He could have guarded it from d1 in some lines. White's got it guarded quite adequately, but, but what black wants to do is tie up white's pieces to, to guarding things so that black can do other things as well. It's one of the ways to win games is to tie things up guarding things and then switch your attack to another square. All right, so white plays rook to a3, maybe being able to play rook f3 in some lines to neutralize the rooks. Black says, all right, I see you're going to do that. I'll move my pawn up to g4. So you can't bring your rook over there. White says, I'll just keep my rook in the middle, keep an eye on things. Maybe there's some lines where you can sacrifice the rook for the bishop, give up the exchange for something. Not yet, of course. Black says, I'll play rook f5. Now, why didn't he just double his rooks right away? Why rook f5? Is there a reason for that? The engine says the best moves are to actually break on the queen side and activate the rook on that side of the board. And it says if Neiman would have done that, then he would have a nice advantage. Well, this is a good place where if you're cheating, you have a choice. You can cheat on all the moves, in which case you play like a 3500 and everybody will catch you right away. Or you could just cheat on some of the critical moves. This is a chance for Neiman to win the game. So if he's only cheating on particular moves, 
he would cheat on a move like this and move the pawn, which is a, a very reasonable grandmaster move, but at least he's playing the move that really gives him the advantage. But instead, Neiman plays rook f5. Well, you could say cheaters might on purpose not do that and wait for a later time, but the later time might not come. So that was his chance if he was maybe cheating to play a move like that. And if he did, nobody would say, oh, a grandmaster would never play a move like that because playing b5 or b6, as I keep saying during the whole game, is a major idea in this kind of position. So if Dan Heisman, who's 2200, knows that, then certainly Neiman, who's 2700, knows that much better than I do. All right, so white plays queen to d2, 0, 0 again. Now comes that rook into the game that way. Engine says white should now break with his break move on the queen side, b4 with equality, and he does. But he's not really threatening anything because if he takes the pawn on c5, black can just take back with his pawn. So black plays rook e5 to attack the knight. The knight is now attacked twice and it's guarded zero times. So white's either going to have to play f3 and let black open up the g file or he's going to have to retreat the knight somewhere like knight c3 where the queen guards it. He takes the pawn first. Okay, so clearly black cannot take the knight on e4 because no matter which way he takes it, white can then play rook takes d4 and get his piece back. So black stops and takes the pawn back. And now he does sack the exchange. Okay, so why did he do that? Well, the engine says white's actually better if he gives up a rook, a rook for a bishop and a pawn. If he does one of the other moves to make it safe, like knight c3, the engine says eh, white's at least equal. It says black can play a move like rook e back to f5 and, and pressure that pawn. But if white takes the hit there, which is not an uncommon move for masters to give up a rook for a bishop and a pawn, and now he plays knight to c5. That's his only follow-up move because the knight was hanging. And now he's threatening multiple pawns. Black just says, okay, you can take one of those pawns. Moriadabi takes the correct pawn. And look, Moriadabi's now up by 0.6. So he's got a good game. Now, if I remember, he might have been a little low on time. I don't remember the time. I don't have the time. Oh, there's the time stamp. And yes, you can see it here. They're playing like 40 moves in two hours. And Mori Dobby's down to 17 minutes and Neiman has 55. So that's a pretty big advantage in time. So Black decides to overprotect his g4 pawn so his queen doesn't have to sit there and watch it. The engine says White's best move now is queen to e4, pinning the rook to the queen. His second best move is to stick the knight into e6. Why not take that pawn, you might say? Well, if he takes the pawn, black all, this knight's very far away from the defense. Black can play here and threaten to take this pawn. If white takes and black plays here, he still can't take because it's pinned. And if he plays a move like f3, black can go after that pawn and then try to mate white on the h file. And that knight is far away. So that kind of play, which, you know, is pretty standard. Again, you know, I've seen that kind of thing before, so we won't be surprised that Neiman does, but the computer is going to help me, of course. So, so keeping the knight on the king side makes sense. So he plays knight e6 and he threatens to win the exchange back, but then he'd be up a pawn. So black needs to do something about that, and he saves the rook. Engine says if he's going to save that rook, he should save it to f7. Engine says saving it to f6 is a mistake. So he saves it to f6. Let's see why it's a mistake. It's a mistake because if he's on f7 and the queen goes down to b6, he can still try some of these attacks. And why can't he do that with the rook on f6? That's interesting. If he plays rook f6 is in the game, and now queen b6, can he still play? Oh, I see. The rook's guarding the pawn against the queen check. That's the reason. That's the reason. All right, so, so in this position, if Moriadabi finds this idea of double attacking this pawn and this pawn, then he, he's got a big advantage, plus 1.8. And we can see 
that Moria Dabi had 17 minutes. Let's see how much time he took on this move. He played that move rather quickly. He could have played slower. He attacks the queen and the rook pawn with the knight. And Neiman just brings the queen back with the idea maybe again getting some of these attacks with the h pawn. So here white has to watch out for that. His best move is queen to d1 so that if black plays h4 he can play queen takes g4 check. Instead he plays queen to a7. Well a move ago playing queen to b6 was with, with the knight on e6 was a great move. Here he's taking his queen away from the defense and now black can start to get a pretty good attack. Black plays h4. Well, clearly white can't take that pawn because his knight would hang. White can check here, of course. White, according to the engine, white should either check or play rook e1. He takes the pawn instead, which is unfortunately not good. If we go back and look, if the time stamping is correct, sometimes these relayed times are not, in, are not correct. After h4, after eight, queen to h7, it said he took 12 out of his 17 minutes. He's down to 503. Let's scroll down a little bit so you can see that. 503 over here. There it is. Okay, we'll go back so you can see everything. Um, so he's down to 503. And he takes there, he's down to 410 to make three more moves. Now black's better after he takes the pawn. <clears throat> and now it, with, with low on time, Uriadabi makes a tactical mistake. He, he makes the recapture and he does it right away without realizing the danger. And now Neiman takes advantage of a pretty neat little idea, which is en passant can only be played on the next move. So Neiman plays the winning move e5. Why is that the winning move? Well, the knight is pinned to the rook, and the only way to save it is to play on Poisson. But you have to do that on the next move. If you do it on the next move right away, he just takes your queen and bye-bye game. But if white saves the queen, let's say he checks, and now black plays, let's say, rook f8 to attack the queen, if the queen takes the pawn and saves itself, then black wins the knight with e takes f5. The engine says even better is to attack the queen first. And now if the queen saves itself with queen to b5, now play e takes f4. Engine says that's a lot better than doing playing e takes. If you play e takes f4 right away, engine says this is a little, gets a little tricky. So you play as Vishenzug first, you play rook 5 to f6, and then you take the knight. But the key point is that when you play here, he wants to take en passant, but his queen's hanging, and if he does something first, he can't play en passant now. It's against the rules. You have to do it on the next move. So Neiman's taking advantage of the fact that Moria Dabi can't play en passant later. He has to do it right away, and he can't because he loses his queen. And and of course, it's very easy for Moriadabi to save his queen, but then he's losing his knight, and he can't save his knight because then he's losing his rook. So black's just winning after e5. And I showed you those lines, but I think in this position, Moriadabi resigned. As the engine says, he's down 6.4 pawns in the line. So he made that one really, really bad move at the end. If he had played the queen check, or if he played rook e1, the, to get out of the pin, the engine says he's at 0, 0. One bad move, now he's worse. Two bad moves, now he resigns. So a nice finish. All right, does this mean anything with regard to the cheating scandal and Carlson and all that? Only this small amount that I mentioned at the start of the video that uh, Neiman's Rating seems to be fairly accurate. It seems to be accurate whether they're watching him really, 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 really closely or maybe in tournaments a few months ago where they're watching him less closely. He seems to be playing around that level. Can people that level beat Magnus Carlsen? Not very often, but 
especially for a 19 year old playing a good game yeah he could so um did he cheat in online games at chess.com and stuff well yes he's admitted that he did how much did he cheat did he cheat more than he admitted i don't know maybe we'll find out at the uh if the trial ever goes to trial if the lawsuit goes to trial i have a feeling they'll probably settle out of court but you know i don't know these things maybe it'll be thrown out of court i don't know i'm not a lawyer i i can't tell you how reasonable the the lawsuit is that's not my expertise okay so let's see how much viewing we get for a neiman in the title uh, video and uh we'll have some fun all right tell my, tell your friends about my channel dan heisman chess if you like the video, put like. If you haven't subscribed, you can do that too. See you next time. Bye.